Hello. Today I want to talk to you about medieval literature. Literature broadly understood as meaning not just belles lettres, poetry and stories, but quality writing in general, philosophy and history and all sorts of things that might well have been included in the great books of the West, uh, but for my perspective, for some reason was unjustly um, neglected, rejected, uh, out of hand for the most part. So today we're going to talk about why that uh, might have come about. And then I'm going to, I've had to empty out my top shelves where I keep most of my medieval literature to put it in front of me so I can show you some texts from uh, medieval Latin first and foremost, the universal language of learning of that time. And then we're going to take sort of a, a walk through the Iberian Peninsula um, into southern France, northern France, through Germany, into Scandinavia. And so I'll put timestamps for uh, Latin and Spanish and French and German and Norse literature in the description of the video. Um, but let me start with um, an introduction, um, sort of searching my mind for why it is that the Middle Ages, which is a general term for about a thousand year period from roughly the year 500 to roughly the year 1500. So a thousand years is generally referred to as the Middle Ages. Everything before that is antiquity. After that is modernity. Um, the Middle Ages has a public relations disaster problem issue. It has an image problem. Uh, it is tarnished with the term Dark Ages. Dark Ages is a general historical term for a time when history, when civilization kind of goes backwards, when um, cities are destroyed and people forget how to read and there's a lot of plague and war and stuff like this. And the Dark Ages is, yes, a time right sort of after the so-called collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the year 476. And after that, there were barbarian tribes and all the things I just described. The Huns were coming through roughly about then and, you know, the people were abandoning cities and literacy was going down. And because there was less writing and less learning, there's less documentation. So we actually know less about that very, very first period of, of the Middle Ages. But to equate the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages as an entirety, to paint that entire thousand years as being a Dark Ages, is just patently false and, and wrong and incorrect. And yet, for some reason, that is very, very, very commonly done. Uh, even among quite educated people who, who ought to know better, there's still that general sentiment that somehow um, it's a monochromatic negative period when pretty much either nothing happened or, or nothing good happened, nothing worth knowing about uh, happened. Um, you might have seen the film Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which shows just a, a, a miserable uh, society. There's just the, the image that that's sort of what it was like everywhere and through all times throughout this thousand years and that there was no intellectual life whatsoever, which is just absolutely wrong. And I, I think that people don't really believe this for the most part, but um, it's somehow become established as, as just sort of an idea. And there are various reasons for kind of going along with it. I, I think people must know that this is not the case because just in any visit to Europe, I mean, the, the way that we judge past civilizations, the thing that we can see most, most prominently is their monumental architecture. I mean, the, the pyramids of the Egyptians and the Great Wall of China. We know the Incas had something going on when we see Machu Picchu and we wonder what those stone heads on Easter Island, what, what that lost civilization is all about. Well, tourists in Europe flock to see the cathedrals and the castles, which in my estimation are second to none in terms of being just fantastic architecture and wonderful buildings that show obviously a society that can produce that kind of thing um, is not an utterly backward place that has nothing going on in the life of the mind. There was quite a bit of it going on in the life of the mind, as you can see from these, these tables in front of me. So 
why has it been so so tarnished with this bad reputation as being nothing but a dark ages? I think basically um, early on, right after that period of about 1500, um, the, the whole period kind of got three strikes against it. For those of you who, who aren't American, don't know that term, um, the American game of baseball, um, you kind of are, are playing, you get your turn to try to hit a ball that another player is throwing at you with, with a bat. And if you, you miss the opportunity three times, then you, you lose your turn. You have to stop. You don't get to hit again. Um, and uh, the Middle Ages kind of got three strikes against it right about the year 15 or 1600 after the, that so-called general term ended um, and has not been able to recover from it, has not been able to, to go back to that again. So those three strikes came in rapid succession from the Renaissance and then the Reformation and then the Enlightenment, sort of the, the subsequent, the succeeding uh, time periods after the Middle Ages when we sort of give terms to history. People who are living in these times don't necessarily use these terms, but we, we put them on them. So uh, the, the first one, the idea of the Renaissance, the rebirth. So if, if people might not have been saying to themselves, hey, we are society, civilization is being reborn, but they kind of had that idea. These might have been people like Erasmus who were doing this in various terms linguistically. One sense that the, the Renaissance was a rebirth was, um, well, uh, for one thing, um, if we go to the roots of Western civilization, it is Greek, and Greek somehow got lost in the West, in Western Europe. Um, early on, the, the Roman Empire, even before it fell, divided into an Eastern half, a Greek-speaking half, and a Western half, so they were separated, a Latin-speaking half, um, and then they sort of went separate ways in history and development. Um, there was a the church developed differently in different in, in the different sides, and there was something called the Great Schism in 1054 when they sort of stopped talking to each other for for a while, uh, and then throughout the time period of the Crusades, there was increasingly bad blood because um, some of the Western Crusaders on their way to um, to to do war in, in in Palestine in the Holy Land said, well, let's let's do war on Constantinople where we're passing through. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of commerce interaction um, between sort of Greek speaking people and Latin speaking people until after the year 1453, towards the end of the, the Middle Ages, when the Ottoman Turks conquered Constantinople. Uh, and there were a lot of Greek speaking refugees came into Europe, Western Europe, and so could teach Greek and, and people like Erasmus became aware of Greek this way, uh, and so kind of went back to their Greek roots, and then while they're looking at Greek roots, started thinking, well, let's let's look at our, our Latin roots, and I don't think they'd ever lost track of, of authors like, I don't know, Cicero or people like that, but taking another look at them with this sort of idea that there's a rebirth and going back to the roots, um, Latin obviously had, had stayed it wasn't uh, like a maternal first language of anybody in the Middle Ages, but it was it was a widespread, widely used scholarly language. It was a living intellectual language, and living languages grow and change. So medieval Latin has some slight grammatical differences from classical Latin and developed a lot of new vocabulary. There's a lot of new ideas and new terms and things like this. And so um, from that kind of perspective, you can look at medieval Latin uh, and compare it with classical Latin and say, well, I'm, we're going back to the roots. Let's go back to classical Latin. So from, from a Renaissance linguistic perspective, um, the Renaissance sort of wanted to be reborn, start over again and go back to the linguistic roots. So that's the first strike. And then about the same time, you have the Renaissance, you have, well, starting really in 1517 uh, with, with Martin Luther, you get the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And Luther himself, um, he really wanted to reform the church, which apart from that East-West split was, was just Christendom. There was only one church, uh, one universal church. Uh, would become the Catholic Church once Luther and others split off from it, the Protestants, uh, as they were protesting. But his original protest was a real desire to reform. There was a lot of, there were problems, there was corruption, there were things that he was saying, this this, this, this should be corrected. 
Um, and uh, instead of being able to reform it, he ended up splitting away. And once there was that crack, there was another split and another split and another split. And so what started out as reform um, ultimately morphed into, with his stay, saying of sola scriptura, only, only the Bible, um, came into being sort of a general, from reform, you got to rejection. Rejection, there's a, there's a general sense, um, a lot of Protestants want to reject everything Catholic. Just reject Catholicism, reject all that tradition, reject everything that's not just reading the Bible. And because the Middle Ages was such a general Catholic um, culture, um, there was a general sense that we should reject all of that. So the Protestant Reformation is, is the second strike, rejecting um, the, uh, the Middle Ages. And then about 100, 150 years later, you move into sort of the, the Enlightenment period, more um, sort of idea, again, we're turning on the lights, we're, we're coming out of darkness. So if you're gonna turn on the lights and you need a darkness to come out of, so you point to the past and you say, that's dark. And you think we've got more hard science and those people were stuck in theology. And, and um, we have, uh, we've gone back to those classical roots. So we've got our pure lines. And, and in, the, in, in the Enlightenment period, you looked at these Gothic cathedrals and they thought they were hideous and ugly. And so they wanted to reject all of that. So that's the, the third strike, the third rejection. And somehow the, I don't know, the general American at least intellectual tradition has been influenced by all of this sort of enlightenment, Protestant Renaissance type thought rejecting the Middle Ages. And even though, as I said, it's, it's, it's not as if this medieval literature is lost and nobody knows about it. It's hidden. It's out there. People do know about it. But um, I think that there are people um, that kind of find it sad to say um, someone convenient to go along with that. If you're somebody like Mortimer Adler and you're saddled with this tremendous task of um, choosing, trying to choose the, from all the great books in history, choose 50 volumes, well, it, it helps if you can whittle things down. Um, if you can kind of pretty much people come together and there is, it's understandable that people are more interested in stuff that's closer to them. Um, it has a more direct impact upon them. And so looking at things that's closer to them includes all of these periods that reject that immediately preceding period. <clears throat> and if you reject that period, if you reject all of these books that I'm going to show you in just a minute, um, then um, it's easier to choose from among the books that are left over. There's still too many. There's still going to be whittling down and rejecting books and stuff like that. But if you can all kind of agree, well, everything in that period, we don't need to consider. We don't need to look at it. Um, then um, the task is that much easier in choosing among among what remains. And so I think there's been sort of a kind of collusion in going along with that, because like I said, there's, there's no shortage of publications like this in any big university. There are people who study medieval stuff, medieval literature. There's, there's lots of publications for it, but still that general mindset of, of people that dark ages and middle ages are synonymous um, is just all pervasive. Um, and I just think that that's really sad and, and, and really wrong. Um, I personally have, have always loved the middle ages, medieval history. That's why I basically got my PhD in, in the stuff that I'm about to show you in, in, in medieval and analyzing medieval literature and looking at, at what we have. So let's move on now into looking at some of the things that I think were, were quite wrongly and sadly excluded from a collection like this and from many great book collections. The stuff on this table in front of me um, is, in my honest estimation, is as rich or richer uh, than many of the things that are included in those volumes over there. To exclude all of this from the intellectual tradition is just like to cut out a huge chunk of, of that conversation. It's terribly unfair to these authors. And if your desire is to know the tradition, you're not going to know the whole tradition if you cut out a huge chunk. And if your desire is as a human being to know what other human beings have really 
striven to know with, with their minds and, and how to express things and understand the world about them. And there's this incredible rich tradition uh, to turn a blind eye to it is, is, is sad and nonsensical. So um, to me, this stuff is as, as, as wonderful as any of the other things that I've shown you um, in my other videos. And as I said last time, because it's much easier to resonate with stuff from your own culture. Um, I wouldn't want to have to do that. I wouldn't want to um, have to cut out any chunk of time or any other civilization. But if I were forced to do that, if I knew that I was going to be cut off and these were, I could only take a table full of books, I'd probably take the books I have in front of me over most of the other books in this room. This is, this is some of the nicest, best stuff for feeding the mind and, and challenging your mind to grow and, and, and think about the world in different ways. So let's have a look now at some of the things that I have in front of me here. Let's go first to medieval Latin. Medieval Latin is not different from classical Latin in the sense that if you learn classical Latin and you want to learn medieval Latin, you have to study anything different, do anything different. But just to, um, before you pick up a full work, like, well, one that did make its way into this collection is uh, Augustine's City of God or, um, or Aquinas's um, Summa Theologica, before you jump into something full scale like that, you might want to have a go at just reading smaller chunks. Again, smaller chunks are, are easier than uh, bigger, long things to go with to begin with. You have a couple of, of books that can ease you into medieval Latin. You have a primer of medieval Latin by Beeson. You have uh, Harrington's Medieval Latin Reader and the, the one that's still in print, Reading Medieval Latin by Keith Sidwell. All of these will just give you small chunks and, and some of the um, vocabulary that is new. Um, you'll point out some of the slight <coughs> grammatical differences. This verb used to govern the uh, the genitive, now it governs the dative and the like. And so these are just good general um, overviews. Um, you can get for classical, you can get in Latin. Um, you can get, again, one of the things that did make it was Augustine's. Augustine's City of God is in there. I forget if this is his um, confessions, but Augustine's confessions is sort of the first full scale like biography where a person bears his soul and you can see what he's thinking and going through and everything. So this is a wonderful book. Um, medieval Latin has so biographies, things like that. Medieval Latin has um, here's Bede's history. There's a lot of really full detailed histories, full scale histories. Um, there's the Gesta de Manorum. There's the, uh, the history of the English people um, that you're going to want to read a lot of things like this. Um, as I mentioned, one of the few things that made it into the great books of the Western world is, is Thomas Aquinas. And so there is this tremendous collection of medieval uh, scholastic philosophy, like Aquinas, very systematic. So here's some of, I have some of collections of Aquinas's works, and Aquinas's teacher was Albertus Magnus. Um, there are other, there's Don Scotus, um, there's Occam. If you have read this book by any chance, Il Nome della Rosa, huh? Um, Umberto Eco talks about all, has, has, um, just mentions all this tremendously rich philosophical tradition that's going on there. So if you're lucky, uh, in a used bookstore, you can get some nice compilations of Aquinas and Occam and Albertus Magnus and, um, uh, all these other scholastic philosophers in a collection like this. Um, you can also find for medieval Latin, um, has wonderful works like here's Thomas and Walsingham's De Arcana de Orum. And this is kind of a rework, well not, it's just sort of an analysis of the mythology that is Ovid's Metamorphosis. So taking uh, sort of classical mythology and sort of interpreting it through Christian eyes. Um, a lot of the stuff is religious, but it's not all Christian. Here's the Le Livre de l'Echelle de Mahomet. This is a uh, the, the the book of the Ladder of Muhammad. This is um, a Latin translation of an Arabic original that's been lost. Um, so this is a an attempt to sort of come to terms with and understand Islam from a, a medieval perspective by translating one of its um, one of its books. And so this is one of the best ways that we know about. 
uh, some whole tradition where uh, the Prophet Muhammad went into heaven with a ladder and, and what he saw there. So this is sort of like um, like Dante or, uh, or or some other vision of paradise. Um, you can get a lot of Latin stuff in, um, if you can read German, the wonderful Reclam editions. So you have bilingual Latin and German text. Here's more philosophy, like I just mentioned. Occam's Razor, you've probably heard of that. Um, texts on the theory of, of knowledge and, and science. Um, the whole principle of, of cutting away and taking the simplest possible thing is one kind of, of so more Latin philosophy. Um, and then you have collections of Latin prose, Latin lyrics. Here's more Aquinas. Um, you have the whole Gesta Romanorum, a whole collection of medieval tales. Um, uh, you have more history and legends and um, all sorts of wonderful things to read in Latin. And you can find online in the, the Latin library, it has a nice section on medieval Latin. And what I like to do from that is print it out using various... Um, various uh, medieval scripts. I'm kind of far away and pinned down by my cat here. I don't feel like getting up and going closer to the camera, but if you can see, I tried to use different scripts. Here's Richard de Bury's Philo Biblum, which is one of the sort of great encyclopedic works of the um, Latin Middle Ages. Last time I mentioned uh, an Arabic book that was an encyclopedia of all knowledge. There, there, I wouldn't want to say that's common in Latin, medieval Latin, but that's, that was a 12th, 13th century phenomenon. There's a wonderful Latin, there's several of those. I can think of, um, Vincent of Beauvais has something called the Speculum, the Mirror. It's an, a vast encyclopedia of, of all knowledge, uh, again, from a sort of personal perspective of how to achieve it. This is kind of like, this is Richard Burry's Philobum, it's also like that. Um, these are various histories and more, um, Another Abelard, his, his, Historia Calamitatum, of how he was basically castrated for falling in love. Kalila and Demna, I mentioned that, the, the Latin, here's the Latin version of that Arabic text that I showed you uh, before. There's a lot of um, ferment going on, in particular, um, in Spain. Um, Spain, uh, let's move on to Spain. Well, let's, let's pass very quickly. Let's explain why we're skipping through Italy. Italy had um, some authors like Dante's Divine Comedy, here's a nice pocket edition, Dante is included there, Boccaccio wasn't, Boccaccio's Decameron, and also um, Petrarch. Uh, Italy has three, at least, authors that are so great that they've been given sort of an honorary pass. Even though they're writing in the 1300s, um, for some reason people say, well, they're not really medieval authors. The, the Renaissance started in Italy um, 200 years before it started anywhere else and just stayed there. So they kind of get a pass and are considered um, uh, not medieval writers, but Renaissance writers. But if we move on to medieval Spain, that's probably the most fascinating culture there, Al Andalus. Um, in, 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 in Arabic, uh, was conquered by Arabic Muslim armies in the year 711, uh, and then totally reconquered by Christian armies in 1492. So what is that? That's, that's more than 700 years when you have, uh, sort of a, a mixed culture. You have, for a long time, it's a part of, Arabic civilization, and then is sort of increasingly pushed out, but there's a mixture of civilizations. And so uh, I mentioned a lot of these people like Thomas Aquinas and, um, and Albertus Magnus. What a lot of medieval philosophy is, is rediscovering Aristotle after he got lost, and they rediscover Aristotle through the writings of Avicenna and Ibn Rushd by, by, by Muslim uh, philosophers in Spain start writing about Aristotle and then people in sort of in Dominican scholars in, in France and Germany hear about it and then they start writing about it too. So um, there's this incredible ferment. Um, medieval Spanish literature, well the, the national epic is the Cantar de Mio Cid and here's a, a nice wonderful Antología de la Literatura Hispánica Medieval. And this has, I mean, there's no standard language at that time. So each area has its own dialect. So each sort of text here, and they've got them divided into um, 
epic poetry where there is the Cid, uh, biographical poetry, chronicles, um, uh, romances, theater, um, science, technology, theology, um, uh, knightly adventures, sentimental adventures, um, dialogues. Um, all of this stuff here is, and I would make a generalization, medieval literature, medieval languages, medieval French, medieval German, um, they are separate stages of the language from what they are now. There's, there's more to it. You do need to learn something by um, when, you, when you want to read all this material, but it's, it's actually pretty accessible. And the key, as for the key of, of learning any language, is reading aloud. If, if you take a text like this or this, and you just try to read it silently with your eyes in your head, it's, it's kind of confusing. You can't follow it. You see a lot of familiar things, but if you read it aloud without or worrying about pronouncing it correctly, but just trying to make, make sense, things fall into place. It, it, it's quite, um, it's, it's not inaccessible. So you have a whole rich tradition of all sorts of things, um, written in various, dialects or, or regional languages of Spain. Uh, one of the richest things is the whole tradition, the musical tradition of Andalusia, um, through, in particular, one of the kings, Alfonso the Sabio, Alfonso X, Alfonso the Sabio, who wrote lots of songs himself. And speaking of writing songs, I don't know if we usually consider music to be part of literature, but maybe we ought to. And if you want to think about contributions that the Middle Ages made to knowledge and to reading and writing and understanding. Well, first and foremost, let's take a step back. Remember last time, if you saw my previous video, I showed you that wall of text in um, some of the uh, the Arabic books with no punctuation and no paragraphs and no nothing. Well, that's what writing was like before the Middle Ages. You didn't have par you didn't have paragraphs. You didn't have separation of words. You didn't have capital letters or small letters. You didn't have punctuation. All of that's a, a medieval invention. Um, so it makes reading a lot easier. And likewise, I mean, obviously we can find musical instruments in, in archaeological finds from prehistoric caves and ancient Egyptians and the ancient Romans and, and Greeks. And all these ancient civilizations obviously had music. But what did it sound like? We have absolutely no idea because there was no musical notation written down. Musical notation is a product of the Middle Ages. So we're going to look at a lot of stuff today that um, is put to music. One of the most accessible ways you can hear some of this is by going to what's called early music, getting some, um, some, some CDs or MP3s of musical ensembles that reproduce early music. And uh, they not only take the words from the poetry that we're going to look at today, but they have actual written musical notations. So it's not the same thing as, 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 as a recording itself, but musical notation is something that we get from starting from people like Alfonso de Sabio. Then if we start sort of moving out of central Spain, the general Spanish areas, one Spanish becomes uh, one of the, 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 doesn't get subsumed into general Spanish. Um, but stays independent to this day is Catalan. So the Catalan tradition of the Middle Ages is extremely strong. And we have all sorts of um, sort of uh, um, allegorical novels and stories. Anselm of Turmeda's dispute, uh, dispute of the, the, the donkey, the ass, Bernard Metz's The Dream. Um, you have Ramon Lull is one of the greatest philosophers and, and thinkers of all time. He engaged in all sorts of philosophical arguments, theological arguments, encyclopedical arguments. Here's his um, uh, Libra de las Bestias, Book of the um, Animals. So this is a um, fantastic work here. And then you have some of what's going to turn into the whole tradition of, of, of writing real novels, sort of long works of prose. Um, here are two from uh, medieval Catalonia. Uh, Gerard Leblanc is quite famous. Uh, Curial et Guelfa is not quite as famous, but it's just ex as extensive and, and rich. So um, that's moving from central Spain, sort of starting across the Pyrenees now. If we cross into from Catalonia, we're going to go into Provençal. And so what's called Languedoc or Oc uh, Occitan um, is an extremely rich medieval literature tradition. Um, and the main people that are associated with that are the troubadours. 
So again, you can get in the same reclam tradition, works of the troubadours, sort of their, their poetic tradition. Um, and then I've got here a two volume set. Um, one is poetic works and one is, is longer works of these troubadours from Southern France. And then, um, the troubadours, the, the whole Occidental civilization was considered to be, um, sort of the Albigensian, um, heresy, uh, might have been actually a, a sort of different sort of dualistic type religion or cloaked as a different sort of understanding of Christianity, but uh, one of the um, first and, and, and sort of most horrible and violent crusades was not against the, uh, the Holy Land, per Palestine, or against the um, sort of the Teutonic Knights going into what's today Prussia, but um, the Knights of Northern France and, and other parts of Europe going in and just sort of crushing this whole civilization um, in Southern France. And so this is La Chanson de la Croissade Albigeoise tells that um, from, uh, from, from both perspectives. So this is the Occitan um, sort of understanding of how their civilization was crushed. And then again, the, before languages are standardized, you don't really have um, an idea of this is that language, this is here. So here's La Chanson de Girard de Roussillon. And this is another um, Chanson de Geste is the name for epic French medieval poetry. And this is sort of a, a transitional language. This is half what's called Lang, uh, Languedoc, which is Oc is the way you said yes in, in southern France. And Oi, Languedoc is, is what becomes uh, French, um, northern French. So this is sort of a transitional language there. So you've got plenty of stuff uh, to engage us in southern France. <clears throat> if we move up into uh, Northern France, we've got all sorts of stuff there. We've got, just as the Spanish national epic is the, um, the Cid, the French national epic, the first work in medieval French is La Chanson de Hollande. Um, and that goes together in terms of being part of a tradition with uh, Le Cycle de Guillaume d'Orange. And Guillaume um, is, I mean, talk about the great conversation intellectual traditions. One of the, the greatest French authors of the, the 19th century, Victor Hugo, um, he wrote um, a whole um, cycle of poetry dealing with the history of the world called the Légende des Siècles. Which there's that thread of civilization going through. Um, and then uh, in medieval civilization, coming up into modern times, coming up into Wagner, um, we have a number of traditions. So here's Tristan, Tristan et Isot. And this is uh, both the French tradition, and we're going to go into the Old Norse tradition too. This has both the um, the well, it's bilingual to modern French, um, but it's got the um, both the the Old French, medieval French um, version of Tristan and the Norse version of it. So there's that. <clears throat> you also have a lot of general poetry. Um, the Counterpart of the troubadours are in southern France. The troubaires are um, poets, similar uh, minstrels um, from northern France. And you can see you've got not just words, but music to go with it. Like I just said, this is a total difference from any of the um, the, the traditions of ancient Greece or, or Rome or any place like that where we have no idea what their music sounded like. Here we have a good idea. Um, we have sort of going with the general development of sort of modern, modern poetry. Here's Charles d'Orléans, uh, Ballade et Rondeau, um, whole cycle of poetry. He was a prisoner and he was captured at, uh, the Battle of Azincourt in 50, 1415. And he was kept prisoner in, in England for 25 years. And so he just wrote poetry for 25 years. So got a lot of poetry. Um, if you like Boccaccio, and Boccaccio and works like him are generally seen as being the, the source, the root for a lot of um, Shakespeare type stories. Where did Shakespeare got his, get his ideas? He got them from Boccaccio and he also got them from Les Cent Nouvelles Nouvelles, 100 um, modern new, new stories uh, from late Middle Ages. Um, if you like pornography, here's some Fabio Erotique. But most of, I wouldn't want to say most, but a lot of what we get from medieval French is wonderful, the whole Arthurian tradition. So the legends of Arthur 
um, really start uh, from the Celtic traditions, the traditions of uh, Wales and, and the Celtic lands, and the Welsh also, uh, when the Anglo-Saxons came in, some of the, those people went into Brittany. And the Arthurian tradition in Brittany uh, sort of maybe seeped into um, the general tradition in, in France. And so in medieval French literature, you have this wonderful tradition of Here's La Mort du Roi Arthur, okay, the romance of Eric, La Quête des Saint Graal, another copy of La Mort du Roi Arthur, Lancelot of the Lake, two volumes. This is a 12th century prose novel. Some of this is in prose. Um, Percival, okay, some of this is in poetry. Um, a lot of this is anonymous, but you have the, the main author, sort of of the French Middle Ages, is Chrétien de Troyes. Here's his Le Chevalier de la Charette, Lancelot, Percival, Eric, et Enid. So um, you have some known authors, Chrétien de Troyes, um, and then you have um, Robert de Baron, who wrote Merlin. This is about you, Merlin, yes. Merlin, Merlin the Prophet by Robert de Baron. And also here, and some of the, in poetic form, um, if you want to, um, those of you who want to get some female writers into the tradition. You might want to look at Marie de France. She's one of the first authors uh, who wrote poetry that we know that really takes the whole tradition of ancient Bret Breton, uh, sort of, so Welsh, uh, Britain, Celtic uh, mythology and the like. So this is full of that whole atmosphere. Um, also mentioning female authors, one very prominent writer uh, of the, the Middle Ages is Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, she was an abbess and she wrote, well, you can hear her mainly, you can hear CDs of her music. She wrote a lot of music, but she also wrote theology, correspondence, all sorts of things. So she's another great author that ought to be in a tradition like this. Um, <clears throat> going on, medieval French literature is, is so rich. Um, you have one of the most fascinating books, I think, really ought to be in a collection like this, is Le Roman de la Rose. Um, has two, one author started it, one author finished it, um, and the author who finished it turned what was sort of a general uh, allegorical dream uh, into a real exploration of philosophy and science and morals and theology. It's, it's an allegorical novel, sort of, um, well, I don't know, like, like Pilgrim's Progress with, I mean, everybody is, yes, it's, it's, it's allegorical. That's fantastic. Um, I showed you last time, if you watched the previous video about uh, medieval Persian literature, here's that Roman d'Alexandre, a uh, 12th century novel. You also have Le Roman de Thèbes. And so these are, this is the Middle Ages coming to terms with antiquity. So I'm uh, really uh, portraying and depicting uh, antique civilization through the eyes of, of medieval civilization. Um, and if you want to see some uh, general anthologies of medieval, so again, you for for uh, medieval French, like I said, for just just like medieval Spanish, reading this aloud is often enough to get more than the gist. There are individual words. There is some grammar. If you really want to engage this, it behoove you to study some medieval French or ancien français. You can get a dictionary for it. But if you have a bilingual text, if you know modern French, you read the ancient French aloud, um, it, it comes to you pretty easily. So these are anthologies that have poets and romances. Um, showed most of that already. Um, anthologies, history. Oh, history and chronicles. That's something we haven't talked about. I mean, you have these wonderful um, uh, Joinville, Villardouin, their chronicles, the Middle Croissant, his chronicles. How do we know about the whole Hundred Years War in detail? What was going on there? Croissant's chronicles. And then, um, uh, co co uh, Philippe de Comines, he wrote his, his, um, his memoir uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages. So again, sort of, uh, like Augustine's Confessions, a personal world view. Um, and then you have a whole tradition of what are called Je et Sapiens, Je, are sort of, well, they're, they're plays, but they are, um, they're uh, representations of the um, biblical things and, and the like for people who are still. And then you have a lot of, um, you do have that whole tradition of books of, of wisdom. Um, as I mentioned, there's the, uh, that tradition of, uh, what did I say before? Um, Vincent de Beauvais, his speculum, this incredible Latin, um, 
encyclopedia, personal encyclopedia of all knowledge. Um, there's also in this volume, and you can get more extensive, there's also Brunetto Latini, who sounds more like a uh, Italian word, but he wrote in medieval French, he wrote Le Livre du Trésor, which is um, the most rich and original of the compilations of wisdom uh, in, 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 in uh, colloquial language. So <clears throat> that is medieval French, medieval Latin, medieval Spanish traditions. Yes, we found the Book of Merlin for you. Um, let's cross the Rhine into Germany and go to look at the medieval tradition of, of Germany. Uh, when we come to, uh, uh, again, French, Spanish, because they're evolving out of Latin, um, we get some of the first poems. You can see kind of transitional stages. Um, German has, well, there is what's known as Althochdeutsch, uh, and there's a few things that you can find, some, some poetic texts and uh, an Evangelian book. There's not too much in, in Old High German, but Middle High German, Mittelhochdeutsch, is almost as rich as Medieval French. I, I, did I say here, these books here, if I'm not close enough, this is Lettres Gothique collection. Um, you have bilingual text, and then you also have various, um, so obviously the French are very aware of their, their rich literary tradition. Um, these other collections, you have monolingual uh, medieval French, and you have uh, medieval and modern modern French side by side. So for the um, for the, the German, Middle High German, you can get um, other publications. So there are things, this is from the um, uh, Manese Bibliothek de Weltliteratur. I don't know quite what that is, this, but uh, most of this is from also the, the Reclam tradition, Reclam books. Um, so these are cheap. Um, I did papers starting to get a bit yellow after I've had these for about 30 or 40 years, but um, they have, again, the essential thing is that they have the Middle High German on the left and the Modern German on the right. And if you, like I said with these other languages, if you know Modern German and you can compare the Middle High German with the Modern German and you read the Middle High German aloud, um, it just comes to you. You you should, you can get also a dictionary and so sort of a, a book for explaining some of the differences for Middle High German. Also, it's not standardized, so each author has his or his own uh, specific uh, particularities, but um, there is, um, it, it's not terribly opaque. So um, in Middle High German, what do we have here? Um, we have also a lot of poetry. Um, we have a whole tradition. So we have from Southern France and Provençal, uh, we have the uh, Les Troubadours, and in Northern France, we have Les Troubaires, and in German, we have the Minnesänger. And Minna is, I mean, this is just one of these fascinating things about medieval culture. You can translate it as love, but just like as you have different kinds of, of, of love in, in Greek and in uh, what do you have, um, uh, uh, different different interpretations of different kinds of romantic love and other kinds of, it's you can't really translate minna by our modern concept of love or the liebe. Um, there's other connotations to it. And you just have to read this poetry to, um, to, to understand it. So there are lots of minna zinger. Um, there are, again, you can find uh, wonderful CDs of Neidhat von den Reuenthal and, and people like that. Um, you can find these little anthologies. One of the you know, major um, ones, who have many volumes, Walter von der Vogelweiter, and you have um, just uh, day songs, uh, women's songs, uh, various, various songs from different uh, poets, which are all put to music with a lot of often music written. Um, you have also in the tradition of um, sort of in medieval high German, you have um, sort of, this is uh, um, Heinrich von Melk's uh, Von des Todes Gehuge, Man rede über den Tod, um, warning about, um, about death, sort of, uh, these are um, before you get um, sort of a philosophical tradition, these are sort of a moral tradition describing um, the realities of life uh, in the form of often of fables and tales and uh, here's Reinhard Fuchs, um, 
uh, again, allegorical tale of the fox, things like that. Um, you have among the major authors of the um, Middle High German, you have, again, playing into the general culture of that time and going forward into Wagner's operas in the late 19th and um, early 20th century. So here's, here's Gottfried von Strasbourg's Tristan. So we have Tristan in the French tradition, Tristan in the Norse tradition, here's Tristan in the medieval High German tradition. We have Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parzival. We have Parzival in here, and here's Parzival in the uh, the German tradition. Again, Wagner made a, an opera about Parzival. Here's Hartmann von Auer's uh, Yvain, The Night, and other um, songs and, and poems by Hartmann. So you have several major authors um, in the medieval high German tradition. And then you have uh, also, um, like we had with the French writing and novels about antiquity, here's an Aeneas Roman um, von Heinrich von Weltke, um, so sort of reinterpreting the, the, the Aeneas, the, uh, the Aeneid. Um, here is Das Roland's Lied, Das Pfaffen Konrad, so reinterpretation of the Song of Roland, so a sort of an, uh, an awareness of general medieval culture. This is several hundred years after the French Song of Roland, so rewriting it from a different perspective. Obviously, we have the. Um, I should have brought where's my Nibelungenlied. I didn't have that here. Um, Nibelungenlied is the um, main uh, book, uh, sort of of old. Um, Pre-Christian sort of mythology sort of reworked into uh, Christian Christian terms. Um, you have other novels from that. And then towards the end of the Middle Ages, you have in German also Heinrich Wittenwiller's Der Ring, which is like the another one of these encyclopedias that is um, is a pretend is an attempt to um, sort of put all knowledge in, 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 in one perspective, in one volume. So that's Middle High German. <clears throat> now let's move on by me to um, Old Norse. Old Norse is, well, Scan we're going through Scandinavia. Um, Old Norse is the language of the Vikings and moved from Norway into Iceland, basically. And so the, the oldest thing that we have there is the Eddas. So we have the Prose Edda, which is a later thing, and we have the, the, um, the Verse Edda, the heroic poems and the, the, the songs of the mythological poems about the ancient Norse gods. As I just said, I don't know where my Nibelung need is. Um, sort of reworked some of the same ideas from that. <clears throat> um, you have in Old Norse, the main thing that you have, apart from the, the sagas and some poetry, uh, or the, the, the Eddas and some poetry, are the sagas. And the sagas, there are different kinds of them. These are all sagas here. Um, most of these are what we call the, um, the, the generally the most famous ones, like Njal's saga and Laxdala's saga, uh, are called uh, family sagas. So they are kind of biographical. They're kind of true. They're about real people in Iceland in the year 1000, 1100, 1200, um, but they also have uh, imagination stitched in with them. Um, then you have what are called the, um, the King's Sagas, and the biggest, most famous one is by the same author as the prose Edda, Snorri Sturluson. He wrote the Heimskringla, which is, it means the world thing, but it's all about the, basically the kings of, of, of Norway. Um, then you have what are called uh, so these are the most famous ones, but you also have what are called the um, the legendary sagas, and those are actually more fun sometimes. The legendary sagas are where you find the um, saga Krak the Volsunga saga. So the Volsunga saga is the the Nibelungenlied in the the Norse version. Um, so you have a lot of um, this is where you find a lot of again the the old pre-Christian pagan mythology reworked into a sort of uh, an epic form of stories. So that's the um, the legendary sagas. Then you have the, the knights sagas, which are basically translations of a lot of the Arthurian type things. And also you have um, some of the same reworkings of trying to deal with um, ancient literature. So here's Alexander's saga. Um, this is a Norse reworking of a 13th century um, Latin version of um, Alexander's Travels. 
And so when I look at all this, I'm amazed. I, I find here this last book is um, a doctoral dissertation written by somebody I used to know. Viking dreams, mythological and religious dream symbolism in the Old Norse sagas that basically starts by looking at these traditions. But as I just mentioned, there's things here that have perfect overlap from <clears throat> the, uh, the medieval high German tradition or that are translations of the French tradition. Um, and looking at dream symbolism, there are medieval ways uh, among the encyclopedic traditions of medieval Latin, there are medieval Latin books for interpreting, interpreting dream symbolism as well. And so in my dissertation, basically what I found was that um, in the Old Norse tradition in particular, what happened was <clears throat> um, they were forced to um, declare themselves officially a Christian nation before they were actually converted because they didn't want to be converted by the sword like the king of Norway was threatening to come over and convert them forcibly. So they said, um, we're going to declare ourselves Christian so that they won't, the king won't send people to um, force us. And anybody who wants to keep practicing the old religion can do so, but they have to do so in private, do so quietly. So you weren't allowed to talk about Thor and Odin for about 200 years, but you weren't stopped from, um, from practicing it. And so in the Old Norse sagas and all of this, in the medieval Ungenid and this year, there's a very strong dream tradition. That's one of the strongest ways in medieval literature. Somebody says, oh, I had a dream, and they give all sorts of details. We saw the Catalan book of the dream and all these things. So in the Old Norse tradition, there's a very strong presentation of dreams and dream symbolism. And in your dreams, you were allowed to say, in the family sagas, you were allowed to say, well, I dreamed about four. I dreamed about these people. So for about 200 years after you weren't allowed to practice the old pagan religions, you could still keep talking about the, the, the myths and the symbols if you cloaked it in the form of, of a dream. And so looking at the way dreams are presented here and presented there. Um, gosh, I spent a couple of years of my life writing these 400, researching and writing these 450 pages. And, and it seems like long ago and far away, almost as long ago and far away as all of this. But it was fascinating then. It's fascinating now. Uh, as I said, this stuff is not inaccessible. Um, it is wonderfully rich and mentally stimulating. As you see, it covers everything from philosophy and theology and allegory and history and chronicles and personal recollections, encyclopedic works, reworkings of ancient legends and myths. So um, I ask you, Medieval literature, is this nothing? Does this deserve to be neglected? Does this deserve to be rejected? I hope you'll agree with me that it does not. I hope this was interesting and um, valuable for you. And I thank you for listening. And I will talk to you again next week.